Right, I've been invited, as you heard, to come and um, be confrontational and confront the title I've been given as Confronting Mathematical Modeling in Economics. So I will. I, I assume confronting means something like being provocative. Let me provoke. Um, my assessment is that in the universities in this country, in fact, most of the Western world, um, in economics faculties, probably more than 90% of what is taught focuses on or uses, employs some form of mathematical modeling. Sometimes at my place it's 100%. My assessment is that almost all of it is useless. It's almost irrelevant to understanding social reality. In fact, I claim not only is it not very good at providing insight, it gets in the way of attempts to provide insight, to provide understanding. And for those of you who care about such matters, not only do I think mathematical modeling is not especially scientific, it gets in the way of any possibility of economics achieving status as a science. So I hope that's sufficiently confrontational as an assessment to, to start off with. Now let me fill in a bit more of the detail, especially about myself. Um, there is a handout which I'm going to go roughly through, but perhaps not refer to very often. I hope you've all got a copy. Um, I take my position, despite what I have just said, to be one that's supportive, in favor of mathematics. It's not an anti-mathematics position. It's not an a priori position. I don't dislike mathematics. To the contrary, I love mathematics. It's a bit like if you have something you value, perhaps an old violin, seeing people use a violin going around the house to knock nails in or dig the garden or even to play the drum in the orchestra. It's got a place in the orchestra, but it's not a drumstick. I see the way economists, the way they use mathematics, is a bit in that fashion. So I'm not against mathematics per se. I'm against the sorts of mathematics the economists have used and the way they use them, and most especially the emphasis on mathematical modeling in modern economics. So I do not see it as an anti-mathematics stand. Um, let me also say something about the context, moving to three on your handout. What's the context in which this talk has been given? The context is one where we've just had, a, a cri or we still have, a crisis in the economy, which is trained people associated with or come to see it as a crisis in the discipline of economics. Most people who look at the discipline of economics assess it to be in a pretty sorry state. What is missed by most of these assessments is there's nothing new in this. Economics has been in a sorry state for the last 50 years or so. It's just through the crisis, people, through, through the comments of the Queen, in fact, the, the, light, the spotlight's been shone on the discipline and it's not come out very well. But actually, I used to give talks. If you look at, um, I'm sorry to plug a book. If you look at my 2003 book, Reorienting Economics, which came out before the crisis, the whole of the first chapter is full of quotes from people well-placed, Nobel Memorial Prize winners and people giving presidential addresses, lamenting the state of the discipline. They don't kind of say it in lecture courses, but they say it when they're invited to give big lectures. I used to bring these handouts with all these quotes with me to convince people economics was in a sorry state. Since the crisis, I've not had to do that. But the point is, there's nothing new in the crisis. Another feature of the, the, the crisis with the discipline that is, another feature of the current situation is we see lots of groups popping up and um, being critical of the discipline, saying we have to do something new, and I guess you lot are one of these groups. Now, the sad thing is, and I hope this is not true of all of you, I find most of these groups do not get very far. They're really quite superficial, and none more so, I'm afraid to say, than the one I met, the one connected with George Soros. I think Soros himself is a very intelligent and sincere person. He's put certainly tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions, into his uh, organization to try and transform economics. But it really is more of the same. And what's missing, I think, from most of these new groups coming to question the state of the discipline, 
is any analysis of what actually is wrong with the discipline. There's plenty of name calling, um, most obviously among Heschelot's groups, which I guess you are, uh, is the name neoclassical economics. And I'm, as, I, as the camera's going, I won't mention names, but it's easy to find person X calling person Y neoclassical, and person Y calling person Z neoclassical, and so it goes on. And it seems like this is sufficient to dismiss whatever the, those people have been put forward. So anything that's different is automatically seen as somehow justified. Or another approach is just to say we're Keynesian or we're this, we're that. Keynesianism hasn't been prominent for a while, therefore it's okay to do it. Usually, and if it's Keynesian modeling, uh, many of the assumptions the claims made are acknowledged to be unrealistic, and it's not clear why unrealistic claims that are called Keynesian are any better or worse than unrealistic claims that are called something else. Most typically, the response is to say, okay, we've got to change the assumptions of the models. Stick with models, but change the assumptions. Sometimes uh, the claim is we've got to find new ways of mathematical modeling. Move from linear modeling to non-linear modeling, from econometrics to simulation theory to fancier forms of game theory or whatever. Different forms of mathematics are brought in. If you go to the INET website, SARS's organization, and have a look at the conferences, you'll see hundreds of papers um, claiming to provide new ways to do economics, you'll find almost none of them that question the emphasis on mathematical modeling. In fact, there's a paper just come out in the Cambridge Journal this week by two researchers who have done a survey of responses to the crisis in economics since the crisis in the economy. And the one thing they find is just about no one questions the emphasis on mathematical modeling. I think it was Whitehead who said a long time ago, if you want to question the philosophy of a period, don't look at the claims, the theories, assumptions that the, the members of the community defend, look at those that they take for granted. That which is taken for granted in modern economics is that the emphasis on mathematical modeling is okay. I'm going to argue to the contrary, it's the cause of the problems in the discipline. But the very least, and what's missing, uh, from people who disagree with me, I think some of you have put forward an alter alternative account of what is wrong with the discipline, why it's gotten such a bad way, how do we explain the problems, and what, therefore, why your solution is stands a chance of being the solution. So the situation, or the other, the other feature of the current situation is all the new attempts, all the new approaches sponsored by Soros or come out under heterox labels, none of them have done notably any better than the attempt, the contributions they've set out to reflect. The discipline is still in a state of intellectual disarray. So the phenomenon to explain is that the discipline is not in a healthy state. It's been like this for 50 years or more. And this covers all branches of the discipline, macro, micro, econometrics, game theory, you name it. And it's going on with all the new attempts to revive the discipline. There's no signs yet of success. My explanation, as I say, is going to be that it's the emphasis on methods of mathematical modeling that is a problem. Clearly, mathematics has been in the ascendancy in economics for the last 50 years, so there's a rough correlation, but correlations don't mean much. The question is why? or how. So what I want to argue is the problem is the emphasis on mathematics. Now to argue it, I want to make a turn to ontology. This is on the handout, it's about number six. By ontology, I mean the study of the nature of being, the stuff we deal with, the nature of society in the case of social ontology. What is the nature of the world that we're looking at, we're examining. That's ontology, study of being. Now, you might say, and people do say, what on earth has that got to do with economics? What's it got to do with anything? What's it got to do with science? Indeed, I hear people say it's got nothing to do with science. That is actually quite a, a, quite a, a daft claim, really. If you think of most of the breakthroughs in science, or if you think most of the debates that come on in natural science and physics, many of them have got almost everything to do with ontology, with the nature of stuff. 
and at, at CERN they've built this electron accelerator and as some of the announced they discovered or I think they discovered the Higgs boson particle and therefore the field and it's all about the nature of matter indeed they're trying to work out why particles according to their best theories are massless how can they account for the appearance of mass we're talking about the nature of stuff debates between Einstein and Barr and the Copenhagen school what about the fun about fundamental nature of reality Einstein as most people know didn't like the idea that it could be probabilistic I don't want to say Einstein's right he was doing ontology discussions today about dark matter or whether the nature of quantum fields particles or waves and so on this is all ontology but it's not just that ontology goes on in natural science we all do it you all do it you did it today coming here you navigated this building to get inside it you weighed up its nature you didn't try and walk through the stones or the bricks you found on the outside you look for a hole in it if you walk through a field and you hear a noise behind you and you turn around if it's a little bird or it's a bull you'll react differently you weigh up the nature of what you see and you act accordingly we all do ontology it's not an option the only option is whether we do ontology explicitly systematically in a sustained way or implicitly now again what's this got to do with my subject matter well we do ontology when we use tools if I said I wanted to use a, 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 a knitting needle or a sewing needle it's, it's, you cannot say for sure what I'm going to do with it but you can be pretty sure I'm not going to go and try and cut the grass or cut the hedge or fly to America or, or, or build a igloo or whatever uh, all tools have the conditions in which they're appropriate whether it's the hammer if, and if you want a job if you want to do a job you weigh up the nature of it the task before you and choose tools appropriately again if I want to cut the lawn I don't typically go and find a hammer to do it I don't go and find a toothbrush I go and find a tool appropriate to it we all of us when we're faced with a task most of the time think what's a good tool for achieving this task except for when we come to economics because there the tools determine before we know what the question is that tool is always a method of mathematical modeling economists have the tools for everything they never ask the question what is the nature of society what is the nature of the stuff we're dealing with the tool comes first and of course society gets molded with the tool rather than the other way round so that's the nature of the thesis I'm going to put to you it's incredibly simple it's so simple I'm forever asking myself why is it neglected and it can only be neglected because people just do not question that their belief in the, the centrality the necessity of mathematical methods okay so let's think of the sort of methods economists use econometrics micro modeling micro modeling simulations whatever what are the preconditions under what conditions are these tools useful incidentally I'm down to seven I'm almost almost finished um, I'm on 7a what sort of reality is presupposed by these sorts of tools for most of them a precondition of their being useful is that there are correlations out there correlations to be uncovered regularity to form whenever x and y mostly correlations slightly in time so x is in the causal history of y so that when income goes up consumption goes up by a given amount or whatever what can we say about these correlations what do they bring with them well of course correlations are consistent with anything happening you could have a correlation between two variables or events x and y it could occur perfect correlation year after year or place after place and each time a different causal mechanism involved it could just be a lucky coincidence a cosmic coincidence but economists of course want to do more than look at cosmic coincidences they want to theorize what's going on and one ontology that's sufficient so to guarantee whenever x then y is a world of isolated atoms now by atoms I mean an isolated I mean a metaphor 
Um, an atom by an atom here, I mean something that has the same independent effect, whatever the context. Think of a wind-up doll, um, and I put it down on a table like this, it just walks forth. It's all it does. Whenever I wind it up and put it down, it walks forward. Whenever X and Y. Or at least it walks forward if I isolate it from countervailing forces. If there's a passing dog or wind, it may end up over there or whatever. So you have to isolate it from countervailing forces, then off it goes. You get a regularity each time. That's basically the ontology of most of economics. Um, of course, it's not a wind-up doll, but it's most of the assumptions put on individual agents are to make sure they do the same thing all the time. Theories of rationality are not there because anyone believes any of the claims about rationality, and there's hundreds of different specifications of rationality. Their job is to turn the individual into an atom, or it's does the same thing. So stick them down, get them to optimize in a certain way, stick them in a context where there's an optimum relative to their ability to optimize, and off they go to it. So you can induce an outcome, you can predict the outcome, you've got theorems. That's the implicit ontology of most of economics. Of course, they're variations, they needn't be optimizing, you can follow fixed rules and so on and so forth, and you can, the atoms can be firms, the atoms can be anything you want. But that's kind of the implicit ontology of modern economics. Systems in which event regularities occur are what I call closed. That word means different things in different system, in different disciplines, but closed systems for me today are those in which correlations occur, event regularities occur. And the ontology that is sufficient for it is a world of isolated atoms, and that seems to be the implicit ontology of most of economics for the last 50 years. I want to defend a different conception of reality, which can explain why if I'm right, it, I can explain why mathematical methods with their its own implicit ontology go so badly. And it's listed as 7b on the handout. First of all, I think social reality is structured. Now, time is short today. I, I would argue and defend this, but I'm just going to explain it to you today. By structured, I mean there are different levels. Now, I think there are different levels in the natural realm too, underneath the falling leaf making a difference to it, there's gravity, aerodynamic forces, thermodynamic forces. There's more to reality than events and our experience of, the, of those events. Same in the social realm. Underneath and grounding, or beyond and grounding, our everyday practices are social structures. For example, social rules. I mean, for example, now at this moment, we're following certain rules of behavior. We're going through certain routines associated with a seminar. Typically, someone sits at the front and talks for an amount of time, and people sit quietly and tend to be attentive and polite and interested, and then after half an hour, they show why they disagree with everything the person said. It's the rules of the game, as it were. Behind our practices are rules. Well, this isn't new, but the claim I want to make is these rules are at a phase with our practices. If you drive on the motorway in just about every country in the world I ever have, there's a maximum speed limit and just about everyone drives above it. Everyone is going faster than the maximum limit unless they see a police car or a speed camera, in which case they miraculously all slow down. They're still being governed in their behavior by the rules of the highway code, but still they're breaking it. Their practices aren't consistent with it. In this country, workers who are dissatisfied, dissatisfied with work conditions often threaten forms of strike action which include working to rule. They have a rule book which lays down what they're expected to do and one of the threats is to work to rule. If, if that's a real threat, if it makes a difference, then clearly they're not working to rule before the threat comes into play. The rule book, in a sense, shapes, guides, facilitates uh, the practices, but it doesn't precisely determine them unless there's this strike threat. So under certain conditions, uh, practices is brought into line with the underlying force. Just like in well-controlled experiment, we isolate one mechanism from all the others and generate an event regularity. So there's structure to social reality. That's the first observation I want to make. 
and that I think is enormously important that that observation alone if correct means I believe that with or without mathematics in economics social theory we can do science and why do I say that it's a long story but basically there are two contending main contending theories of what science is about or what is most essential to it one of them has it's about correlations and prediction and the other one has it as about getting at causal mechanisms causal mechanisms underneath the event I adhere to the second one science is about identifying the cause of the apple falling on Newton's head or if cows wobble their heads and fall over what is the cause of that cow's disease those are the symptoms go behind to get at the cause we don't especially want to predict where the autumn leaves are going to fall or how many cows which is the next cow or how fast it takes for the wobble if it's got mad cow's disease we want to get at the cause these are two competing conceptions of science if we do ontology I think we can see why the second causal conception is the better one because we can look at the first conception prediction is account and ask under what conditions do most, most correlations come about? Under what conditions does a predictionist account work best? And the answer, standardly, is in well-controlled experiments. Well-controlled experiments, correlations are generated. Every time I drop an object, uh, any kind of object, a leaf in a vacuum, an experimental vacuum, it falls with a constant rate of acceleration. But the question to ask, the ontological question is, what must the world be like that we have event regularities in the experiment that we don't get outside the experiment? Why does the autumn leaf fall with a constant rate of acceleration inside but not outside the experiment? And to answer that question, you have to appeal to more than events and correlations. The only answer I know of is that in the experiment, what goes on is a, a mechanism is isolated from countervailing mechanisms. You isolate, in that case, gravity. And you get, the correlation is a correlation between the trillion of the mechanism and its unimpeded effects. So, to make sense of the best case of prediction as counter science, you still need to invoke the idea of causal mechanisms. And you see science is really about empirically identifying those causal mechanisms in the well-controlled experiment. But it's the mechanisms that matter, and they operate inside and outside the experiment as I wave this about gravity is operating on it whatever I do with it gravity doesn't just operate on it when I drop it in an experimental vacuum what goes on in the experiment is the empirical identification of a causal mechanism that operates all the time so science I'm suggesting is about getting at the causes the causes of mad cow's disease rather than correlations and prediction which are just an element in that process well, if that's so, and I've argued social reality is structured, then we can do science in economics or social realm too. We can go from practices to the underlying causes, to the structural conditions. I mentioned rules, but the social relations, institutions, all sorts of social structures behind everyday practices. We can go from practices bound up with crises, practices bound up with creation of poverty or whatever you're interested in, to the underlying social structural causes. That move allows us, just like it allows literature and history and every other discipline, to do science. Not only is mathematics not required for that move, mathematics can't do that move. In making that move we're going from phenomena of one type to a very different type of phenomenon. We're going from cows wobbling their heads and falling over to the cause, a prion. Uh, of a protein that changes shape. One type of thing to typically, as yet unknown, very different type of thing. Mathematics is very good if you want to do deduction, go from the general to the particular. If I, if someone tells me your ravens are black, I can deduce the next one I see will be black. Mathematics can be very useful there. Induction, mathematics is useful. If I've seen 100 black ravens and I infer all ravens are black, I can do it using mathematics. But if I start from the blackness of ravens, I want to know what's the cause of the blackness, and is if I use retroduction or abduction, a different type of inference, mathematics can't help me make that step. And that's the essential step in science, I'm working to suggest. 
Okay. Um, social reality is structured. Moving on to B, it's also highly internally related. Relations are internal or relata are internally related when they're constituted by the relationship in which they stand. Currently, I'm constituted as a seminar presenter through the relationships in which I stand to you as a seminar attendee. We are currently internally related in the context of this seminar. More precisely, the positions we're in are internally related. I'm in the position of the person who presents the seminar. You're in the position of people who attend it. Next time you have a seminar, someone else will be in this position. I expect some other people will be in positions you're currently in. Attached to all these positions are rights and obligations. I have an obligation to speak for a while, and you have the obligation to sit quietly, then you have the right to tell me where I'm wrong, and I have the obligation to answer your questions, and so on. These are the basis of social relations. My obligations related to your rights, your rights, obligations related to mine. And of course, for this seminar to work, to lots of rights and obligations elsewhere. Someone's obligated to fund this seminar room, to keep it heated, to, to make sure it's clean, etc. We've all got obligations to university authorities here in some ways to behave in certain ways. Social reality is made up of positions related to other positions to other positions, where positions are constituted in relationship to each other. Seminar giver, seminar attendee, teacher, student, employer, employee, landlord, landlady, tenant. And it's not just general social relations, the most fundable, fundamental ones in economics too. Money is one such obligation right relationship. In that case, between whoever possesses a piece of cash, or is cash, and whoever issued the cash, who is the debtor. Credit debit relation is a right obligation relationship. In these positions, we don't just get people, we get certain communities of people. A corporation is precisely a firm that's been incorporated in position as a legal person with all sorts of rights and obligations that normally accrue to human beings. What I'm saying is ontology is fundamental to economics. It's not just something that sociologists will ever deal with. The point is, though, all of the social realm, all its components are internally related to everything else, constituted relationship to everything else. Same with the monetary system to the finance and the industrial system, etc. Everything is constituted under capitalism in relationship to everything else. Um, moving on to C, social reality is also inherently dynamic, processual. Think of language. I'm speaking to you now in English. Up to this moment, I wasn't conscious of the fact that I was. It was an unacknowledged condition of my speaking to you. But as I speak to you in English, and as you listen in English, and as thousands of millions of other people over the globe speak and think and write in English at this moment, together we contribute to reproducing and transforming the English language. And we do transform it. Funny people talk about ontology, bring in their own words and transform it. People who use uh, mobiles, use text, shorten words to make it fit in. The language is being perpetually reproduced, transformed through use. The language, like English, is an unacknowledged condition of our speech acts, and its reproduction transformation is an unintended, typically unintended outcome. But nevertheless, that's, it is reproduced in, through the sum total of our speech acts. That is its mode of being, it's in process. It's reproduced, transformed through practice. But what's true of language is true of everything in the social realm. The social realm just is that realm of phenomena that depends on us for its existence. And all of it is reproduced, transformed through practice. This seminar is transformed through practice. This university, this college is transformed through practice. This university, this town, the economy, the financial system, your personal identities. Everything is reproduced, transformed, through practice. It's inherently processual. That's its mode of being. 
Okay, I've gone through a few elements of this alternative social ontology that elsewhere I defend at length. Already, I think I've said enough to indicate why mathematical modelling gets it so wrong. Remember, the ontology of mathematical modelling is a world of isolated atoms. I'm saying social phenomena, far from being isolated, everything is constituted in relationship to everything else. We can't isolate the employer from the employee, the monetary system from the industrial system, etc. Everything is constituted through everything else. And rather than being atomistic, rather than everything acting in a fixed manner, everything is reproduced, transformed through practice. Everything is in a process. A process is essentially a transformation. So now we have an explanation of why economics has fared so badly under the influence of the emphasis on the sort of mathematical methods economists have used. The world itself is open, it's processual, it's constituted each part in relation to everything else, but in order to get mathematical methods going, we have to treat it as though it's atomistic, isolatable, and indeed isolated. We have to treat it as though it's quite different from what it is. So no wonder it not only lacks its planetary power, but every claim economists make is unrealistic because complicated, totalizing aspects of society, including human beings, are treated everywhere as atomistic and isolated. And that's what all the fictitious claims that we see in economics do. Be perfect calculators, perfect foresight, rational expectations, omniscience, two commodity worlds, etc., etc. They're all done to close the system and render what, what implicitly is being dealt with, covered, a world of isolated atoms. Um, I'd like to go on. Emergence is my favorite topic, but I see I've um, used up my allotted time, so I'm happy to talk about emergence. Um, social realm, well, let me just say, Emergence is very important. Everything from quantum fields up to society, it, we got from there to here through, through emergence, from novel phenomena coming about, and I think the basic mechanism is through a recombination of what was there already. This building, or any building, is put together by recombining, or combining, bricks and pieces of glass, pieces of wood, to make a totality. Now, the totality has powers over and above the bits and pieces that are put together. If you take apart all the bits and pieces of the house and reassemble them in a random fashion, a blind fashion, chances are you won't get the properties of the house. You won't get some provide shelter. The arrangement, the organization matters. And that's true all the way from quarks up to society. The organization of the parts matters. Social reality, I believe, is made up of uh, communities, totalities, where the components are often human beings, and the relator, what the relator I talked about, the rights and obligations relating positions, is what ties it together. It's the cement of the emergent totalities. Emergence is a big part of the story, but I don't need it to undermine or to criticize the emphasis on mathematics. I just say that very quickly, quickly to give you a feel for what impressed me. Okay, so that's basically it. Now, let me finish by saying I'm not, I hope it's clear, I'm not anti-mathematics. I'm not even saying there never could be any useful, any use for mathematics in economics. In fact, to the contrary, by doing ontology, we can see under what conditions mathematics might be useful. The sort of methods economists have traditionally used, I've suggested, have an implicit ontology of, group, of systems of isolated atoms. So we can say, when do we get systems of isolated atoms in the social realm? Well, people become pretty atomistic in their behavior and they're stuck in traffic jams in Russia, for example. So that sort of behavior probably can be modeled mathematically. Um, the demand for heating uh, electricity, or at least for heating in uh, Alaska in the middle of winter is pretty predictable because it's a basis for any other kind of activity. So it all depends on the context. Using this ontology, rather than just saying mathematics first, give me a question, the order needs to be reversed. 
when can we use mathematics or given the question we want to address is this an appropriate context for using mathematical methods we have or trying to develop new forms of mathematics if it's thought that new forms can be appropriate I certainly can't and I think no one can prove that mathematics can never be useful that new forms of mathematics can't be developed that won't prove, prove useful I do think it's highly unlikely, but I cannot prove it. But my claim is the emphasis on mathematics at present is all wrong. Um, the ontology of society is such that the sort of mathematical methods we currently use, we currently teach, I currently teach in Cambridge, are not appropriate to the subject matter. I'm not saying exclude mathematics from the toolbox, but I'm saying allow other tools into the toolbox. We, at present, we've got every reason to think other methods would do better. If I was to give you another talk, I could argue the methods I think are most useful. But the point is, let's not just restrict it to mathematical modeling, which, for reasons now I think are understandable, has prepared to date so badly. Now, I said... I think the emphasis on mathematics is bound up with a des I haven't said it, but I think it's bound up with a desire to be scientific. Economists wrongly think science is all about prediction. I've, I've tried to suggest that's a wrong impression. I mean, it's very difficult to characterize science, but it certainly doesn't reduce the correlation in prediction. I think getting causal mechanisms is a, a, a more fundamental feature of science. But let me finish up with prediction, because I know how prediction is seen to be so important to so many. What am I saying in, in, in my talk about prediction? I'm basically saying because social reality is open, we can't have it very often. Not event prediction anyway, not the social realm. But I'm also saying because it's structured, we don't need it. We don't want, we don't need to predict where the autumn leaves are going to fall or where, how many times which cow is going to wobble its head and fall out, but we want to get at the cause. We don't, we don't just want to predict the outcomes, or we don't particularly want to. We can get at the cause, and the causes are not nothing. We can explain the phenomenon. So prediction, we can't have it. We don't need it. Finally, I don't think we want it, because we want to change the world. We don't just want to be able to predict levels of poverty in 20, 30 years' time, or the incidence of AIDS, or how many crises we're going to have. We want to identify the causes of those aspects of the world that we don't particularly like and change them, transform them. And happily, the ontology that I put forward, I defend, allows us to do that. That's not an argument for it, of course, but that is the happy consequence of it. So prediction, we can't have it, don't need it, and don't want it. What we can have is the ability to explain and understand the world and then and we have some wisdom to make it a better place. But before we can start down that road, I think we have to get rid of the emphasis on mathematical modelling at the moment. I hope that's sufficiently confrontational.